my name is Hello, my name is Domi and I'm a sports coaching student. Welcome to my presentation series in which we will explore, discuss and analyse the role of sport for development. This is the final presentation and today we will draw upon critical academic literature to evaluate and assess the impact of sport for development. In the two previous presentations we have explored what sport for development is and how it differs from sport development. We analysed why sport is such a powerful tool to use for development and we explored the history of sport for development. We delved into the development organisations, how they contribute to SDGs and how mega events can support the developing countries. I have done some more research about impact of sport for development and here is what I found. World Health Organisation have estimated that 33.4 million of people live with HIV and 67% of those people are based in Sub-Saharan Africa. Half of the new infections occur in people aged between 15 and 24 and 12.6% of youth in South Africa have sex before the 14th birthday. Based on this, Bainicol and colleagues have suggested that developmentally appropriate sex education should be provided to children as young as 10. Mary and colleagues have established that children in South Africa didn't know about HIV or AIDS, which means that they had no control over it due to poor attitudes towards using condoms. Isolation of orphans was also noticed, especially those affected by AIDS. Therefore, the researchers have introduced HIV education using peer coaches. The peer coaches worked under the researchers' supervision for eight weeks. They delivered sessions which consisted of soccer training, learning about AIDS and life skills, and soccer competitions. During these competitions, the children were encouraged to play five to seven aside games and join in with friends. This was done to maximise positive social influence and foster social support. During the eight weeks, the peer coaches received support and education from the researchers to assist them in their tasks during the project. As an outcome, the researchers noticed more positive attitudes towards using condoms, better perceived behaviour control, increased knowledge about HIV and AIDS, and better general sex practice for greater beliefs, abstinence and exclusive sexual relationships. The researchers also noticed a safer and more cohesive environment. These findings were established through comparing the results with a control group who received HIV education with no involvement in sport. The researchers have found that using peer coaches makes HIV education extremely effective as both groups who took part in the HIV education workshops with soccer training had higher HIV and AIDS knowledge after the eight weeks than the two groups who took part in HIV education without taking part in the soccer training. Based on the research of Mara and colleagues, Balfour and colleagues have introduced the people of Peter Maritzburg in South Africa to new project. The project was created by WizKids United and the 12-week program was called On The Ball, which was also known as WKU and OTB. It was delivered to elementary school youth and the results were compared to the youth who only received classroom-based HIV education on behaviours and HIV-related knowledge and stigma. Balfour and colleagues also stated that self-efficacy is a crucial predictor of risk behaviour. This is why WKU aims to foster self-efficacy and encourage youths to make healthy choices and build respect to HIV prevention. Good self-efficacy also helps to withstand peer pressure to have sex before they feel ready for it and insist on using condoms if their partner dismisses the need for it. It also helps them to make the decision about accessing counselling and sexual healthcare services. Therefore, the program consisted of eight sessions, each 90 minutes long, with the aim to connect soccer fundamentals to learning critical outcomes of HIV prevention. It was delivered in the public schools by the WKU counsellors who were trained to use a detailed WKU OTB manual for the program. Each session had a few different types of activities. Pictures, Q&As, key statements, group activities and soccer coaching. It was designed for up to 50 pupils at a time of equal numbers of boys and girls. And the content focuses on disseminating important HIV knowledge, building self-esteem, and helps to develop healthy coping strategies to deal with peer pressure regarding alcohol and drug use. This research also relates to the Nat Hopani project, which is co-run by Sports in Action, also known as SIA. And that Wapani is a prevent project which the aim of is to reduce sexual and gender-based violence, also known as SGBV. It's based in Zambia with the focus specifically on the northern province. The objectives of the project are first, to challenge and change beliefs, attitudes and harmful traditional practices. And second, to increase accessibility and use of the comprehensive support services for the SGBV survivors.
To meet the first objective, SIA created Young Men as Equal Partners Initiative, also known as YMEP. The aim of this initiative is to synthesize and educate the boys and young men on gender equality, positive masculinity and sexual reproductive health. They are taught through the power of sport about constructive behaviour and practices in the communities as well as rights and laws to prevent gender-based violence. But how is the YMEP programme implemented? SIA trains sports coaches, club leaders and volunteers to deliver the YMEP sessions. The sessions that they deliver focus on promoting gender equality and preventing sexual and gender-based violence. The trained sports coaches, club leaders and volunteers also act as mentors to the boys and young men both on and off the sports field. The coaches are role models and they have a huge influence in shaping the participants' behaviours and attitudes towards girls and young women. The YMEP sessions are also conducted during sports tournaments, sport leagues and sport training sessions for boys and young men. The sessions and events are delivered at sports clubs to provide an established channel to reach those most in need. Using these venues helps to sustain the project activities, which is important as behavioural change in young people takes time and this change can only happen through consistent, regular and long-term engagement. SIA uses sport because as Mary and colleagues have established, sport helps to improve the social environment by making it safer and more cohesive as it brings people together regardless of their age. This new safe environment provides the boys and young men with a safe place to openly discuss the issues that might affect them. They also use sport because, as we discussed in the previous presentation, sport is a major catalyst for developing transferable skills, and everyone can understand the language of sport. Although there are some benefits of the mega events happening in the developing countries, as we explored in the previous presentation, for Brazil the drawbox heavily outweigh the benefits. For starters, the sport events were disrupted due to the political issues, the torch ceremony was delayed, the audience booed the president at the opening ceremony, and efforts were being made to impede the women's marathon. But where do these political issues come from? A large portion of Brazil's population did not welcome the mega events. This is because of the major lack of funds for the teachers and doctors to be paid, and the rich occupants of Brazil being protected at the expense of the poor. Even when the preparation for the Olympics went ahead, major inequalities in payments could still be observed. For example, an International Olympic Committee executive was paid £700 a day, compared to the cleaners at the Olympic Village, who were paid only £10 per day. Another major financial issue is the fact that the money spent on one stadium which was only used for two weeks would be enough to rebuild the mangrove swamps. This would recuperate damaged habitats and build wastewater plants to prevent contaminations. Since Rio has been on an economic decline for the last 10 years, many members of the public viewed the Olympics as a distraction more than a solution. These economic problems have affected the volunteers, as between 5 and 10% of them have not showed up, which meant that the morale of those who showed up has been decreased. The citizens from the favelas believe that Olympics only made things worse, as many promises have not been kept. For example, free tickets were promised to the poor communities, yet none have been offered to anyone. Instead, the tickets were given to the families of the volunteers, and not many of them were from favelas. This resulted in many empty stadiums. There were many issues with running the games. First, as we just mentioned, the stadiums were all very empty. Second, the water in the swimming pools was very clearly discoloured, which made the athletes very concerned. Third, there were shortages of food stores for the visitors, even with the empty venues. Another broken promise was that the Olympics would help with cleaning up the environment, specifically the Guanabara Bay, which did not happen and some competitors have fallen sick because of it. And this obviously has caused a lot of embarrassment for the hosts. During the Olympics, active army propaganda was around, as the armed forces were present in and out of the games. Additionally, 8 out of 9 Brazil's medals were won by competitors who have previously served in the army, navy or air force and some of them have saluted on the podium, which reinforced the propaganda of the country's previous long dictatorship. Overall, not a great look. For many years now, the police has been trying to fight with the gangs to prevent drug trafficking, which led to many people dying with an average of one death per day. Here is a quote from a book chapter by Barbassa, who described the citizens' relationship with police as while living under the control of heavily armed drug dealers was undesirable, few felt any allegiance to the police, whom they knew from violent spasmodic incursions that left the bodies in their wake. During the mega events there have been numerous crime incidents, such as armed robberies, 
muggings and shootings with two fatal victims. Unfortunately, many of these have been undermined by Ryan Lochte's fabrication story. You can find the article that covers the timeline of events for this in the description below this video. Of course, the foreign athletes and visitors were protected in the relatively richer areas. But what about the native citizens and athletes? Papasta has described this as an image of Brazil safe for some. Tourists, investors, athletes, even if that safety came at an expense of the welfare of others, the favela residents themselves. Comparing the amount of positive and negative arguments about the Rio Olympics, it's really hard to say that mega events are a good way of helping the developing countries. Won and Song have stated that the Brazilian government's huge investment of public funding in two back-to-back -back mega sport events occurred at the expense of local development, which is a higher priority at Brazil's stage of development. Therefore, I think that mega events are not only an unsuccessful approach to developing a country, but they can also be dangerous, as proved by the quotes from Barbas's book chapter. I believe that a more appropriate approach would be implementing more sport-driven initiatives to work with the Brazilian public to help build the country's legacy through its people. A good example of that is the Tri Rugby Project in St. Paul. It was created by the British Council, Premiership Rugby and SESI in Brazil. The focus of the programme is to use rugby to teach children, youth and adults about positive values and transferable skills. Hall and Rees state that there is an underrepresentation of Brazil as a research site in the Spot for Development literature. This means that there is a need for more academic research about Spot for Development in Brazil. I also struggled to find Spot for Development initiatives in Brazil, which makes me think that there aren't that many around compared to other parts of the world. For example, there are many organisations and projects to assist the development of Africa, Right to Play, Go Sisters or Spot in Action. Is Latin America being neglected? So based on what we discussed in the previous presentations, the research by my own colleagues and the case studies of OTP and YMEP, I think that sport used appropriately is extremely powerful. And sport for development programs are extremely beneficial for individuals taking part, the community they live in and the nations they make up. Therefore, I think there is a dire need for more sport for development initiatives in Brazil. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments down below and I will do my best to answer them. I will see you in my next presentation. Stay safe and goodbye.